Good morning. There we go. Now I'm loud. That was, uh, that was on me, not on y'all not having me turned up. I forgot to turn it on. Um, I'm glad that you have joined us for worship here this morning. Uh, in the way of announcements, I invite you to uh, look at a couple of things specifically. Uh, tomorrow will be uh, Feed the Hungry in the morning as well as our Monday um, meeting night. So if you're involved in any of those things, uh, please make sure to remember uh, all of those events tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday night will be our normal schedule with handbells, adult Bible study, kids choir, uh, supper, and adult choir. Uh, so I encourage you to remember all of those. And uh, this weekend was supposed to be March Mission Madness, but due to scheduling conflicts with our youth, we won't be going. So because of that, Dr. Whitaker won't be here with us next week, uh, but he will be with us uh, on April the 3rd. So if you're looking forward to him, just a couple more weeks and you will get to uh, hear from Dr. Whitaker. Uh, also in your uh, bulletin, uh, you will find a, an insert uh, with a letter from Paul Baxley, Executive Coordinator of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, on the uh, ongoing crisis in Ukraine as well as our uh, ministry over there. Uh, there are a number of things that, that uh, CBF is uh, doing in that part of the world to, to help out with the crisis and uh, the information on how to, to give uh, to that is there as well. Uh, one sad update uh, to that, you'll notice in the first paragraph, it talks about the, the village of hope in uh, Kiev uh, that has been going on there for a number of years. Well, on the, um, I believe it was the 10th or the 11th, the Russians actually bombed our CBF ministry housing uh, there. Thankfully, it had been evacuated, um, but our... Um, base of operations there in Kiev has been destroyed by the Russian military, so um, there will be lots of work and um, resources needed to, to rebuild uh, that ministry there. So uh, please uh, consider giving to uh, the work of CBF uh, in the Ukraine and in general as you feel led. Again, I am glad that you have joined us this morning. Now, may we worship together. Please stand for our opening hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed.
morning. So there is this children's song about a mother duck and her five little ducklings. And one of the little ducklings will wander off. And what do you think the mama duck does? She calls them back. And by the end of the song, all five have wandered off. And what is she still doing? And then do they come back? (laughs) Hopefully they come back. She keeps calling until they come back. And I like this song because it shows how much the mother duck loves her little ducklings, right? She keeps calling for them, and when one gets lost, she keeps calling. Do you think she'd be satisfied if only one duck came back, or is she going to keep calling for all five? Yes. Yeah? I think she'll keep calling for them because she wants them all to come back. And I think that's a really good picture of the love that Jesus has for his children, The Bible tells us one day Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he cried. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather you, gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So Jesus wants to gather us together and to protect us and care for us and shelter us if we come to him. So, and I think that today Jesus is still calling us. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for loving us so much that you keep calling to us to come to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand again, if you will, for our offertory hymn, The Solid Rock. before you our financial offerings we give you all that we are and everything that you have entrusted to us come bless these gifts for the sake of our of your kingdom and glory amen
please stand for the doxology.
Now our text for this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17 through the first chapter, first verse of chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, it is, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of His glory, by the power that also enables Him to make all things subject to Himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. As I'm sure we're all aware of by now, Lent is a season of prayer and repentance and a time to recommit our whole selves to Christ. And as I shared with you last week, throughout this season of Lent, we're going to look specifically at the values that we hold as Christ followers. And last week we looked at the value of belief itself, what it means to believe in Christ and to hold Jesus Christ as the core of our faith. And today we turn our attention to discipline. I know everybody loves that word. Uh, for me, it traumatizes me back to, to elementary school and um, a, one particular hardline teacher, but I digress, you don't need to hear that story this morning. But discipline in this context, in a spiritual context, means being committed to a certain way of living, to live with express purpose in what we do. And the goal of that discipline, in Paul's own words, is so that we can stand firm in the Lord. He encourages us then to discern what it is that we should be doing to achieve that goal. And he also calls us to discern what we might not need to be doing. Things that would get in the way of achieving that goal of standing firm in the Lord. And he calls upon us to depend upon Christ as the source of our transformation, the source of our discipline, so that we might truly be people who value our walk with Christ. And in telling us how to stand firm in the Lord, he gives us a couple of things that we need to do. One, he tells us that we clearly should pay attention to who our role models are, who our influences are, and to know the difference between good and bad influences in our lives, to know the difference between agents of good and agents of destruction in our life. He encourages us to pay attention to, to what Christ is calling us to do and Christ's power of transformation. He encourages us to be aware of whether we are intentionally living with the purpose of following Christ. And in thinking about those things that he tells us here, I found it helpful to, to ask three questions. One, what do I want out of life? Two, how open am I to transformation? And three, who do I ultimately want to be like? And the answers to those questions have a great impact on how spiritually disciplined we will be, how committed to living out this value of discipline and standing firm in the Lord that we really are. When it comes to that first question, what do I want out of life? We could also say that that's our purpose. That is our what. It is what drives our actions. It's what fuels our passions. And it encompasses our work, our relationships, 
our approach to living our lives. It encompasses everything that we do. It wraps around every single facet of our life. And to live discipline, to live with purpose, means to be intentional about our actions and how we live. And that gives our lives a, a sharper focus. When we ask the question, what do I want out of life? It shapes us. It shapes our purpose. It gives us an end goal in mind where we're not just wandering around, lost. And when it comes to that question, what do I want out of life? There are approximately a gazillion answers to that question. And there are as many, if not more, forces at work in our lives trying to tell us what the answer to that question should be. I think back to a spiritual retreat I was at at one time, and we were all given these little slips of paper, and we were asked to write down on each of those slips of paper something in our lives that shaped our outlook on life. And then we compiled all of these and listed them all on this huge whiteboard. And to me, it was absolutely astonishing the number of forces that are at work in our lives when you lay it out there. Church, school, family, friends, community, media, advertising, jobs, clubs, organizations, social media, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitch, TikTok. I, I don't even know all of them. There's so many anymore. But that goes to prove the point. There are so many things vying for our attention, so many things that influence our outlook on life for better or worse. And in that retreat, our leader, he pointed out all those things from everyday life, but then he made a point I will never forget. Out of all those forces at work, Media, advertising, social media are the only ones that are literally paying billions of dollars trying to influence us. And if we aren't careful, their investment pays off in ways that we don't necessarily want it to. Now, I don't say that to disparage media or TV or even social media. I love good TV as the next guy, and I love scrolling through social media and looking at cute cat and dog pictures. That's about all it's good for these days, but... Okay, maybe I am disparaging social media a little bit, but maybe it deserves it. But the cumulative effect of such a connected world with this 24 access to media is this tremendous shaping force on our life. And I imagine if Paul had to live in our world today, he might would have rewritten verse 19 to say, their minds are set on digital be it our TVs or our phones or whatever. But there's this relentless barrage of things that want our focus, that want our attention, that want to shape what it is that we want, whether it's money or convenience or the shiniest or the biggest or the best of whatever, whether it's a literal product or a politician or a mindset in general. There's so many things that are vying for our attention, trying to set our purpose, telling us what we should want. And equally, there's many forces at work preying not only on our wants, but trying to exploit our needs. Forces that exploit our anxieties and our fears. Forces that promise to meet our every need, promising to give us everything that we could possibly ever need if we will only buy or do or follow what they say. And Paul knew in his day that constant discernment was absolutely necessary from the people of God because he understood that their wants and needs could easily be influenced, that they could be met by less than scrupulous people and ideas with evil intentions. If that was true... In Paul's day, where information had to travel mouth to mouth, ear to ear, across the landscape, how much more is that true in our day and age where it can be on the other side of the world like that? 
we are encouraged to decide if what we want and need out of life are things that follow the cross or in fact enemies of the cross. Is what we want out of life truly what Christ values? So then discipline is learning to answer that question through the lens of Christ, a Jesus filter, if you will. It's our best chance to stand firm in Christ. And it takes discipline to do that. But when we do that, it makes it abundantly clear what should actually matter in our lives what we should want out of life, and what is worth wanting, and what our needs really are. If we honestly ask ourselves that question, and our answer doesn't line up with what Jesus preaches, then we aren't practicing the discipline that we claim to hold to in our Christian values. So then, that leads us to the next question. If we don't like the answer we find in the first one, how open to being changed are we? Paul doesn't stop with just being able to tell the bad from good and the hurtful from helpful, though that's well and good, but it's not enough. Discipline means following Christ beyond simple discernment and actually doing something about it. Moving toward radical change, toward transformation, transformed so that is if we know where our citizenship lies, which is, is in heaven, not will be in heaven and that's an important distinction because that means that standing firm in Christ being disciplined means knowing that our lives right now are manifesting the kingdom coming God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven it means being willing to be transformed into a Christ presence in the here and now Discipline means being willing to be changed into who we are called to be this very day. Not someday in the future, not when we're dead and gone from this world and living in heaven, but today. Spiritual discipline means living with the expectation that Christ is at work in our lives today as they unfold. If we truly hold Christian values, then we must value to being open to this discipline of change. In Romans 12, 1, Paul put it a different way. He said, we are called to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. But to do these things, to clarify our purpose and our, what we are called to be, to open ourselves up to change, to grow in our spiritual disciplines, to help us clarify what it is that we want out of life. Paul's quick to remind us that we need examples to follow. And so the text opens with the phrase, join in imitating me. And that sounds egotistical. But it's not intended to be, for arrogance is not a Christian value, never has been, never should be. But rather, this phrase is a reflection of the first century world, where any kind of leader or teacher was viewed as a model of behavior. If you were someone's disciple, link to the word discipline, then you viewed and watched everything that your mentor was doing. Wanting to imitate someone wasn't about inflating their ego or being exactly like them, but it was a model of learning. And you know, in many ways today, that's still true. There are many things that the best way to learn them is to watch it done. Like, for example, learning how to change my own oil growing up. You could have explained it to me, you need to take the plug out and drain, yada, yada, yada. But you know what? It picked up on it a lot faster underneath that hot car. And seeing where the oil plug was, seeing where you put it back in, seeing where if you put your arm, you're going to burn yourself. Sometimes it's just practical to want to imitate or follow somebody. It's not ego. 
And that's what Paul's getting at. One can be aware of their abilities and call upon someone to follow their example and simultaneously be humble. And I think that's the part of it that we've lost in our modern world. The ability to hold oneself to a higher standard and be humble about it. But for Paul... It wasn't about the recognition or being told how awesome he was. But he did his best to practice what he preached and he expected those listening to him to do likewise. Because what he really wanted, what he's getting at, is that he wanted people to see Jesus when they saw him. It's a bold goal. But it's one that any of us who claim to be a follower of Jesus should aspire to. And I'm sure we've all had those people in our lives. Think about the people in your life who have been your significant mentors or teachers or spiritual influences. It's likely their impact on you didn't come from just what they told you, but how they lived, by what they did. They likely did this very thing for you and modeled the qualities and needs and ideals that agreed with their words. We've all had followers of Jesus whom, in this sense, we imitated. Not trying to be clones, but rather influencing our goals and our purposes. To be a follower of Jesus means to follow the examples of others and to be an example for others. That's a major part of this spiritual discipline. Discipleship. If we want to live out the value of discipline, then we have to want to be discipled while also being willing to disciple others. We can't mature in our own faith if we're not willing to help others mature in theirs. God's grace isn't only for us, but we are to take it and relish in it and dispense it to others so that others can experience God's love and hope through us. So that others can imitate us in a way. So going back to the beginning, discipline, discipleship, Being a disciple is all about the value of standing firm. And the Greek word for standing firm here, Paul uses it numerous times throughout all of his writings. And each time he uses it to refer to this toughness and this fortitude that's found only in being grounded in God's way. Only found in standing in the grace of God, in the power of the gospel, and the very purposes of God. It's standing in that way that God can transform the body of our humiliation to the glory of His own. So then if we hold tightly to this value that we profess to believe, then maybe, just maybe, if asked, others could say about us, here's where I've seen faith in this person. Here's where I've seen hope. Here's where I've seen love. May we stand firm in the faith. Amen. Our hymn of response, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Please stand as we sing.
Let us pray. Lord, how thankful we are for this church and the lessons learned here this morning. May we now leave this place seeking to put your love into action here in this community and around the world with our eyes open to see the needs of your children around us and our ears and hearts open and willing to hear your call to serve. Guard us and guide us in all that we do and may everything we do be to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.